It's happening right now. Creation Ministries International and Bible Discovery TV Network present the Creation Super Conference of 2011. We're blowing your mind with biblical truth in a stunning display of discoveries in science. Join us now as we go live from Muskoka Bible Camp into the Super Conference with Bible Discovery TV and Creation Ministries International. Well, just because the sun goes down doesn't mean the conference is over. Far from it on this beautiful Monday evening at Muskoka Bible Center. I'm Rod Hembry. We are live on Bible Discovery TV. Our coverage continues of the Super Creation Conference 2011 with Creation Ministries International. You just previously heard an outstanding presentation by Dr. Danny Faulkner, Universe by Design. Did you hear all that? That was like, my mind is like in overdrive now. I have like a notebook full of stuff. So anyway, I'm going to be focusing on his book. Coming up, this is going to be an interesting uh, presentation uh, by Dr. Jonathan uh, Serfati, and he is going to be talking about refuting compromise. Now, many of you know there is a book based on that as well, and this has to do with the compromise that's involved in the peer pressure and the societal pressure that Bible-believing Christians feel that they must compromise to become friendly to the world, so we must give up our sacred reality of truth uh, of the creation to give up on the world just to be in with the scientific crowd. Well, you know, this uh, Messianic Jew uh, is an amazing man, a great man, uh, learning to be a good friend of mine, I'll tell you that much. Uh, Dr. Jonathan uh, Sarfati refuting compromise coming up in just a few moments. Also, uh, just a quick note, we will be here again tomorrow morning on the streamtv.com, on BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And uh, Jim Mason, Dr. Jim Mason, I was just talking to Jim, he, nuclear physics and the young age earth. Very, very interesting. So uh, that's going to come up in the morning. Also, Dr. John Sanford is back now. Uh, introducing Dr. Jonathan uh, Safferty is, of course, uh, Calvin Smith, a great speaker himself from Creation Ministries International. I do not want to take up any more of your time. Let's go inside now and listen to this amazing presentation. Here he is. ...to a theater and watching Expelled when it first came out. And if you haven't seen this movie, you really need to because it's got some absolutely astonishing uh, interviews with uh, famous atheists, and of course there's a very famous interview at the end of the movie where Ben Stein sits down and talks to Richard Dawkins and there was a couple of things that came out of Dawkins mouth that honestly I think my jaw fell open and I looked over at Richard and I said did Richard Dawkins just say that? <laughs> so it's, it's a great movie and uh, you can show up here at 945 and uh, we'll just be starting to play it. Um, you may have noticed obviously the resource table out there and uh, we've got some great deals uh, for you. We understand that many of you traveled from a, a a distance to get here. So, uh, for example, there's a lot of great DVDs out there of the, the talks of the various speakers. And what we're doing at the conference is if you buy four DVDs, we give you a fifth one for free. Uh, I know this gentleman here has taken advantage of that several times. Um, and we also have a credit system. You'll notice that on uh, the far table, there are sections set up, and you see these signs. It says one credit, two credit, three credit, et cetera, et cetera. And there's products behind there. And what that's for is that uh, if you spend $100 here at the conference, we just, uh, you just keep your receipt, and you come up, uh, every $100 you spend, you can get a credit towards these free resources. So, for example, you spend $100, you go up, you give them the, your, the receipt, you can choose any of those resources that are in front of that, uh, that pile. And you can, you know, uh, keep track of that. Uh, the, the more you spend, the more you get. I guess that's the, the marketing ploy, isn't it? <laughs> um, and also, uh, if you bless CMI with a donation, every $50 donation also counts as a credit as well. Um, if you're an off-site uh, guest here at, uh, you're just coming in for the sessions, um, many people are staying at hotels and motels in the area. Um, if you come down and you're at the sessions and you decide, well, you know, it'd be great to go swimming or go canoeing or something like that, you can visit the NBC um, front desk, and it's only $5 per day per adult, and I believe they have a family pass as well. So take advantage of that. Uh, have fun here at the, the conference in between sessions as well. Um, chess. You're playing chess tomorrow, John. That's what I hear. 
<laughs> and uh, I think Richard already announced that uh, uh, because we don't have a caller, uh, Jonathan has agreed to pay, play 50 people chess at the same time. How many of you guys are into chess? Hands up. Well, that's not 50. We need more. Come on. I mean, I kind of play chess. I'm thinking of sitting in if the, there's not 50. But anyway, I won't last long. promise you, Jono. But anyway, sign up for that. First 50 people get a crack at them. Um, good luck. Anyway, um, Jonathan has uh, obviously spoken uh, uh, before here, so he really is, uh, in creationist circles, a man who needs no introduction. Uh, we had him up in Canada for a Canadian tour. The first time he was in Canada, he informed me uh, just a, a little while ago, and it was an absolute smash. People were so excited about his talks, and you guys are going to be blessed with him as well. So, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati, let's, uh, let's give a hand. Oh, thank you again for, for, for having me here in my second time in Canada. Uh, this is a very uh, important topic uh, about uh, the, those who want to compromise what the Word of God says because of what they think a science teacher. So they're basically putting science above the Scriptures. And of course we do have a lot of answers for this already. Uh, like our website, creation.com, with over 8,000 articles and 50 or so topic uh, heading Q&A pages and a very handy search button on the top left uh, of it. And we always think that we're actually asking two, but answering two basic questions here. First, is creation true? And the second is, does it matter? Because uh, it's a frustration we often have in trying to organize ministry in certain places. Uh, they think it's a side issue. It doesn't matter. And, of course, I want to show that it does matter. But, of course, it, it, the, it, the most important thing is that it's true. And uh, the topic of this talk, uh, largely, is this book called Refuting Compromise, which I wrote. Uh, first of all, I wrote it in, in 04, uh, which was the CMI year of refuting compromise. And it was updated earlier this year. So there's a, a brand new updated version of that. Now, this is quite a, a, um, a comprehensive tome. Um, but we do have a sort of cut-down version of this, in a sense. 15 Reasons to Take Genesis as History. Sort of a, a summary thing, a book that you can hand to uh, someone who doesn't want to uh, take the time to read the, uh, the full thing. They've got no excuse not to read 15 Reasons. You can buy these in bulk and give it to the uh, people going to the uh, theological cemeteries. I mean, seminaries, uh, which <laughs> compromise on, on, on Genesis. And we have this DVD from the last uh, conference, uh, Six Days Rarely. Now, uh, my talk uh, in that one was all about uh, Hugh Ross, uh, who is one of the leading advocates of adding millions of years to the Bible and where this goes wrong in so many different areas. I'm going to talk about that as well, but there's another uh, danger that's come on the scene fairly recently. This is the organization BioLogos, which is a very vocal theistic evolutionary organization in the States. It was founded by Francis Collins of the Human Genome Project. And uh, their whole aim is to convince Christians to believe in evolution, not to convince people that the Bible is true. They don't care about uh, they, they have uh, debates about whether the Bible is true or, or not, but the main thing they agree on is evolution is true. And Christians really must accept that, even if it means their faith goes out the window. The important thing is accepting evolution. Now, where it goes wrong, where it starts off going wrong, is a statement from, from uh, Dr. Ross. He says, so God's revelation is not limited exclusively to the Bible's words. The facts of nature may be likened to a 67th book of the Bible. So basically, he's putting uh, so-called science on level pegging with Scripture. But of course, in practice, what happens when they seem to disagree is always Scripture that gets reinterpreted, not science. And yet, Jesus himself uh, said, Scripture cannot be broken. And so many times he would say, it is written, quote, the Scripture. And that, for him, settled the argument. For Jesus, whatever Scripture said is what God said. And it should be, therefore, the basis of our thinking in every area it talks about. And it's quite interesting to look at what Jesus affirmed. He affirmed all the things that the skeptics most love to scoff at. He affirmed Jonah and the great sea creature. He affirmed uh, Cain killing Abel. He affirmed the floods of Noah's day and Noah and the ark. He affirmed Adam and Eve. He affirmed all these things the skeptics love to scoff at. 
So if we are Christian, we should follow his view on what the Bible says. And what does the word Bible stand for? Basic instructions before leaving earth. Now, one thing that, we, that I've come across, that, and that's part of the biologist movement, is this man called Peter Enns. Now, it's interesting, there's a bit of a, a, conf- a, a um, controversy with the homeschooling movement with Peter Enns, and it actually did enable me to give some talks at the homeschooling conference in Cincinnati uh, instead of uh, Ken Ham. But one of the things was Peter Enns, and he has written a book Uh, called the uh, Incarnational View of Scripture, where he's basically undermining the authority of the Bible. Now, I want to give you a proper Incarnational View of Scripture from another ends. This is Paul ends. Don't confuse Peter ends and Paul ends. Paul ends is the good guy. Okay? And he says, There's a correlation between the two aspects of special revelation. The Scripture may be termed a living written word, while Jesus Christ may be designated the living incarnate word. I discussed that in the morning. In the case of Christ, there was human parentage, but the Holy Spirit overshadowed the event, ensuring a sinless Christ. And that was a question that was asked uh, this morning about the virginal conception. How come Jesus didn't get original sin? The answer is the Holy Spirit overshadowed, preventing original sin being passed on. Okay, in the case of scriptures, there was human authorship, but the Holy Spirit superintended the writers, ensuring an inerrant word. The Bible accurately presents a special revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the correct incarnational view, acknowledging both the human and divine aspects of scripture. And God didn't overrule the personalities of the Bible authors, but ensured they wrote accurately what God wanted to, to be recorded there without any error. Now, you look at the way the Bible authors treated Scripture, and one was uh, in the book of Acts. We have the Bereans were of more noble character than the Thessalonians, for they received the message of the Apostle Paul with great eagerness and examined the Scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. So you see, even the Apostle Paul was checked by the scriptures. And so how much more should we check people like Hugh Ross and Biologos with the scriptures? If they don't match up the scriptures, don't believe them. But you see, what uh, I think the Biologos and Hugh Ross did, they'd have to reinterpret this verse or rewrite this verse. Uh, so it's Compromise 1711. And we have uh, these Jews were more, more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the word with all eagerness, examining the word and the scriptures daily to test them against uniformitarian science and reinterpreting them accordingly. I've actually written a list of, of all the, the, what the Bible would have to say if the compromise position was true. And this is uh, basically one of them. And yet we find very clearly that uh, the Bible tells us all Scripture is God-breed and profitable for do- doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Uh, all Scripture, not all Scripture apart from Genesis 1 to 11, all scripture is inspired. And then, you see, the theologian Louis Burkhoff had the right idea about scripture versus science. He tells us, since the entrance of sin into the world, man can gather true knowledge about God from his general revelation only if he studies it in the light of scripture, in which the elements of God's original self-revelation, which were obscured and perverted by the blight of sin, are republished, corrected, and interpreted. Because, I mean, nature itself has fallen, so we should use the unfallen word of God and scriptures to interpret the the fallen creation we see around around us. Uh, Hugh Ross and Biologos do the other way around, using the fallen creation to undermine God's perfect word in the Bible. He tells us further, uh, some are inclined to speak of God's general revelation or nature as a second source, but this is hardly correct in view of the fact that nature can come into consideration here only as interpreted in the light of Scripture. So the Scripture must be primary, and that tells us the correct view of nature and enables us to build uh, the correct sort of models, like the flood models you heard about last night. And the question is, what does this authority tell us? Well, let's look at Genesis 1, which is the, the uh, point at issue here, but not just Genesis, as we'll see. And we see here's the Hebrew of Genesis, and you see the common pattern here, uh, there, and different things are created on different days. 
very clear statements. And here is something which uh, refutes some very well-meaning Christians will say, well, don't worry about the millions of years. At least the order is right. Isn't it wonderful how the order of, of, the, uh, of the Big Bang and paleontology match up with the order of Scripture? No, it doesn't. I mean, just, just think about this. On, uh, the sun wasn't created until day four. The Big Bang puts the sun before the earth. It puts the stars before the earth. That's contradicting what the Bible tells us. Um, the, the evolutionary picture is that the uh, whales and the birds evolved from land creatures. The Bible tells us whales and birds were created one day before the land creatures. So the order is uh, back to front in quite a lot of different areas. Not just the time frame, but the order of, of events doesn't match up. So what is the um, answer here? Well, for one thing, uh, let's uh, do this, this principle, a very important principle here. You have fancy Latin names for it, uh, Analogia Scripturae, which is the analogy of Scripture, which says that Scripture is to be explained by Scripture. To understand one part of the Bible, you should look at other parts of the Bible to see how they, um, they explain each other, because the Bible does not contradict itself. So we've got to look for an explanation which doesn't contradict the other parts of Scripture. And this is what I want to do uh, now, is to look at how the rest of the Bible looks at Genesis chapter 1. Now, for one thing, uh, to look at Genesis 1, we should try and find out something else in the Bible that has a similar structure to Genesis 1. And that is... Numbers chapter 7, because both of these passages have numbered sequences of days. You see, in Numbers chapter 7, we have this um, passage here. The one who brought his offering on the first day was Nachshon, the son of Aminadab of the tribe of Judah. What we have here is a dedication of the tabernacle. You've got 12 tribes of Israel. Each of them sends one representative on consecutive days. So you have the second day, Another tribe, Issachar. The third day, Zebulun. And so on and so on and so on. And then you get someone from Naphtali bringing his, his offering. So this is one day after the other, one of each of 12 tribes brings his offering. And the point is, no one is doubting that these were ordinary numbered days. It's, it's what you see when you have consecutive numbered days. You know they are ordinary 24-hour days. So what is the big deal with Genesis 1? It's not the Hebrew that tells them that it's not numbered ordinary days. It's because they're bringing outside ideas upon to the Hebrew. And furthermore, here's something else. In both of these, they're ended in a similar way. Now, you have uh, some compromises. They look at Genesis 4 and say, these were the generations of the heavens and earth in the day they were created. In the day when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And the point is, they say, well, there you go. Here's a non-literal day. That shows the days of creation were non-literal as well. Not a very good argument because in the Hebrew, the, in the day is sort of like one word, be-yom. Yom is day, be means in, and they're combined. This, this be is a preposition, so you have this, this compound construct in Genesis 2.4, which is the Hebrew idiom for when. But you haven't got this compound in Genesis chapter 1, so you can't wrench the words from one context and throw it into a completely different context, which is what they're trying to do. It is not how you do um, biblical interpretation. And the same thing happens with number 7. You've got this closing comment in the day when it was anointed. And then no one is going and turning around that and saying, maybe the days of the dedication were millions of years long. No, it just doesn't work there. It just shows that the, the, um, they're not getting their long ages from the scriptures. Okay, well, what sort of language is Genesis then? Now, some have said that, that it's poetry. You've got this person like Timothy Keller, who is a, one of the biologists. People think, people think he's a great Christian apologist, but he is talking nonsense about Genesis. He thinks it's poetry, but let's look at what poetry looks like in the Bible. The Psalms are typical poetry. And one aspect of poetry is not the rhyme or the, the, the rhythm, but parallelism, where you say one thing, then you say the same thing in a slightly different way. Now, the heavens are declaring the glory of God. The firmament proclaims his handiwork. Well, the firmament and the heaven are both up there, the same thing, basically. 
not exactly the same, but it's enough similarity there. Then we have day to day pause for speech and night to night declares knowledge. The same sort of thing happening. You've got the 24-hour cycle. 24-hour cycle, you've got this declaration of God's glory in the heavens. There's another sort of parallel, parallelism. It's called antithetical, where you say one thing and then say the opposite. See, look at this. Uh, the wicked flee when no one pursues. The righteous are as bold as a lion. You see, the wicked and the righteous are, are opposites. Uh, the boldness, the cowardice are opposites. Uh, the he who keeps the law is a wise son, but a companion of gluttons shames his father. See, once again, you have the, the opposite, the, the son and the father, wisdom, foolishness. So this is what poetry looks like. You don't find that in Genesis chapter 1. You don't find this anywhere in Genesis unless someone is being quoted. The first example of poetry in the Bible is Lamech bragging to his two wives about killing someone. You think that's the poetic, little, little poetic part in Genesis chapter 4, but the rest of Genesis should look like that if it was poetry, but it doesn't. Now let's look at what Hebrew narrative looks like in the Bible. And we have this verb pattern with Hebrew narratives. Uh, it says uh, the narrative begins with this particular type of verb called katal or historic perfect, and continues with these verbs called vayiktol or the vav consecutive. Now, vav is a Hebrew letter. It also means and. And consecutive means one thing after the other. So it's a special type of verb for a sequence of events, a narrative. This is history if you have this sort of verb pattern. Yet, what do we have in Genesis? We have the first verb is the katal, bara. In the beginning, God created. That's the first verb. It's the heading of the narrative. Then you have a series of the Vav consecutive verbs. So you've got, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that it was good. You've got one Vav consecutive after another. Just what you'd expect to find if Genesis 1 was historical narrative. It is written in historical narrative form, not in poetry. Now, there's no doubt that it's a structure of a narrative. There's certain repetition there. There's a good pattern going on. You see, you have four different parts to it. <clears throat> like you have God's command, let there be. That's the first part of, of every day. There's a special type of verb there. It's called the just of verb, which can mean either a command or a request. And of course, by being God, it's a command. Okay? And then you have the fulfillment. And it was so. God spoke and it was done. You see, that's the thing. It's a rapid fulfillment. Not millions of years of fulfilling, but a rapid fulfillment. Then you have the assessment. God saw that it was good. In fact, seven times we had this, uh, God saw that it was good. The seventh time, it was very good. I think he's trying to tell us something there. Then you have this closure of the day. The day closed off as evening and morning. So once again, you've got clear evidence of ordinary days because you have the evening and the morning. Long periods of time don't have evenings and mornings. So this goes through the, all, all the, the six days of creation have this general pattern. And the thing is, and it was so, this rapid fulfillment has shown because God is the creator of time. He does not need time to do things. You see the miracles of Jesus who is God incarnate. He did not need time. He didn't need to grow grapes and, and then uh, uh, squeeze the juice out and ferment it to grow wine. He just created, turned the water into wine. That's all he did. Didn't take time. That's his miracles. He didn't take any time. But let's see, also we see this in this encounter with a centurion, um, a very godly centurion, one of the, the God-fearers among the, the Romans who loved the Jewish people and helped build the synagogue. He was a, he very much a pro-Semite. And, and uh, under the Abrahamic covenant, God promised to bless those who bless Israel and curse those who cursed Israel. So yeah, the, the, the um, centurion asked for help and said, um, my servant, servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible uh, suffering. And Jesus said, I'll go and heal him. And you have this dialogue from the, the centurion 
saying, um, I don't deserve to have you, but say the word and my servant will be healed. I'm a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one go, he goes. This one come, he comes. Do this and he does it. Being a centurion, his orders would be obeyed without question and immediately. So how much more would the orders of God himself be obeyed? No time at all. And so Jesus marveled at this faith and uh, uh, said, go, it will be done just as you believe it would. And the servant was healed at that very hour. So we see this teaching God on earth and hu uh, uh, human nature added, he healed, he didn't need time to do it. You see, he was not bound by time. And the centurion recognized this in Jesus, that being God, he was not bound by time. So how much more do we see in Genesis 1? And it was so that God did not t need time to create. He didn't need six days. He, he gave us the six days as a pattern for our working week, not because he was limited in any way. He could have done it instantly. He spread it out for our benefit. Now, let's look at what I'm saying here. Is here is the pattern. In Exodus chapter 20, we see this pattern here, uh, the fourth commandment, to, to remember the Sabbath. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, the seventh is the Sabbath to your God. And the reason for this is explained very clearly. Uh, for in six days the Lord made the hair, heaven and earth and seen everything in them and rested on the seventh day. See, uh, here, here is a clear case that the days of creation must be ordinary days, otherwise the days of our week aren't ordinary days either. So you work for six million years and rest for one million years. It doesn't make any sense. So that's the logic of the long age position, the day age position. And everything in them was created. The whole universe was created. Uh, every creature, the angels, must have been created during creation week as well. All the extrasolar planets must have been created during creation week. That, that's the logic of this position, but it was very, very uh, quick, as we see. Now let's look at Jesus himself. I told you Jesus affirmed Genesis. Well, here is one example of where he affirmed Genesis in teaching about marriage goes back to its origin. At the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. And the Hebrew, echad, one. You see, that's what I was saying this morning. That is a composite unity. Two become one. Just like the Trinity. Three persons, one echad, God. So what's he saying here? He's quoting from these two, chat, these two verses here. And you see, uh, unlike a lot of the theological cemeteries today, he didn't believe they were contradictory creation accounts. You see, he realized that in the ancient Near East, what you have is a summary outline of the whole, and then you focus in on one particular aspect of it. You see, Genesis 1 is the summary outline of the creation of the whole universe. Uh, Genesis 2 gives you far more details about the creation of man and woman. Like uh, Adam was created first, um, then he was named all the animals as an exercise in authority over them. Because Genesis 1, we read that God gave dominion over uh, the rest of creation to male and female. And Genesis 2, you're spelling that out. God named, Adam named all the animals. And then you have um, him put to sleep and the, the rib... Um, and then we see he created from Adam's rib. And that's, again, why you have the two become one flesh, because Eve was taken from Adam's flesh. See, it all makes sense if you have the history of Genesis. You know, it was clearly a man and a woman, Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. Okay, so no, no room for the gay marriage stuff in here. Despite people who want to tell us that Jesus said nothing about gay marriage, well, I think he did here. Quite clearly teaching that right from creation it was a male and a female. So here's a little question for you. Who has more ribs, men or women? They do have the same, yes. And here's one video about that. It's called Arguments Creationists Should Not Use. And one argument not to use is men have one less, one fewer rib than women. If you don't believe me, go and count them. Or think about it sensibly uh, with real uh, science. Um, the, the skeptics will attack the Bible. It's based on Lamarckian evolution inheritance of acquired characteristics. This is not science. Even evolutionists are mostly embarrassed by that. But think about this. Uh, you men, if you chop a finger off, how many fingers will you have? 
Uh, you'll, have, you'll have one less. How many will your kids have then? It won't make a difference, will it? And the Bible tells you this because the Bible commands a, a, an amputation for Jewish male babies. And it had to be repeated every year, every generation. It kept on coming back. So the Bible doesn't teach bad science here. This is one reason to be familiar with arguments we should avoid. It's one of the most uh, read articles on our site as arguments creationists should not use. And even Richard Dawkins commends that. Now this passage also has implications for the age of the universe. Jesus talked about the age of the universe. Um, look at this one. At the beginning of creation, God made the male and female. And do a timeline. Do a timeline to scale on some very fine graph paper if you like. And the biblical timeline gives us about 4,000 years from creation to Christ. You can add up the numbers in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11. And you get a rough idea. Okay, now you put Adam and Eve about six days afterwards. Now, six days compared to 4,000 years, that is right at the beginning of that number line. You can't even see the difference. You have to use a, a powerful magnifier, microscope, to see the difference. Now, look at the Big Bang Theory that uh, Hugh Ross and, and co. believed, say 13 billion years since the Big Bang, and then you got Adam and mankind swinging down from the trees about a million years ago or so. It's right at the end of the number line. It doesn't make any sense. You can't say from the beginning of creation, God made the male and female, if you've got 15 billion years where nothing happens. So you just can't mix the two pictures, the Big Bang or Jesus. That's the options you have there. They can't both be right. Now, Paul, uh, the apostle, affirmed Genesis as history because he repealed to the order of events. He said, For Adam was first formed, then Eve, but he, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. You see, even the events of Genesis 3, but also the order of Genesis 2, are affirmed as history. And he builds his doctrine based on the actual history of Genesis and even when he teaches about justification by faith alone, the vital doctrine of the Reformation, what does he do? He goes back to Genesis. In Romans chapter 4, he says, uh, we have been saying that Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness. That's Genesis 15. Under what circumstances was it credited? Was it after he was circumcised or before? It was not after, but before. And he received circumcision as a sign, a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. So you see, the whole doctrine of justification by faith alone is based on the order of events as real history, that his faith happened before the circumcision, the work happened. So if you abandon Genesis' history, you have to throw out this whole doctrine of justification by faith based on this Genesis history. I was asked about Melchizedek in the morning. Now, again, the author of Hebrews in chapter 7 explains the superiority of Jesus' priesthood because it's the order of Melchizedek, this, uh, very, uh, this figure who appears in Genesis 4 and vanishes into history. And the point is that um, the Jews of the time, they believed the Levitical priesthood was the, was the uh, end of everything, okay? But uh, what the uh, author of Hebrews was doing was saying the order of Christ, the Melchizedek priesthood, was superior to the uh, Levitical one because Melchizedek had tithes offered by Abraham, who is the great-grandfather of Levi. So here we go. We have Melchizedek pre-existing Levi. So once again, the order of events in history is the basis for the teaching of the superiority of Jesus' priesthood. So quite over and over again, you have to understand the history for the doctrine to matter. In fact, I'd even go as far as to say that nothing in the Bible makes sense except in the light of history. Now, what about the idea that, that some compromises, uh, not Hugh Ross, but others, they believe in things like analogical days. They say that it's, they sound very pious. They say that it wasn't man's days, it was some sort of God's days. Now, that's a, a very strange thing. Remember what I said about Scripture? It was there to teach us. 
And uh, here is one um, theologian, uh, Herman Huxema, who said, what if, God reveal, what, if what God has revealed to us has a different meaning for him than for us, God is not only incomprehensible but unknowable, then revelation itself is not true and reliable. If the words mean something different for God and for man, he's not communicating to us. And therefore, uh, Second Timothy is wrong. That scripture does not teach us because the words mean something different for God and for man. This is unacceptable. And he also says, either the logic of revelation is our logic, or there is no revelation. If God had some sort of different logic from us, then, he, then the Bible again wouldn't be teaching us. Uh, the, the logic that we get from the Bible, which proves things like the Trinity from the uh, things taught in the Bible, well, if, it, if it's divine logic and human logic, then we can't do anything, uh, deduce anything from the Bible. We couldn't deduce six-day creation from the Bible if there's some sort of magic divine logic different from human logic. Now, what's different about God and us is that God knows every true proposition. He knows, he knows everything. We only know parts of things. Okay, but, what, but God knows everything infallible. That's the difference between God and us. We, we just don't know everything. We are, we are creatures, not creators. But the thing is, what we do know, God knows as well. Uh, we know one plus one is two. God knows exactly the same thing. But otherwise, there's no revelation to us. If there wasn't this correspondence between what God tells us and what man tells us, if they meant different things. Uh, if you want to know a bit more about that, this video called Leaving Your Brains at the Church Door is about the importance of logic in understanding the, 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 the scriptures as well as defending the faith and refuting evolutionary arguments uh, against the faith. Now, one argument uh, that is a very important one is how has the church historically understood Genesis? Now, I'm not saying um, uh, I'm not a Catholic who, who goes too much into the church tradition. The Bible is the final authority. But why I'm talking about church tradition is, is twofold. One is... How did the church understand the Bible before the rise of millions of years in science? See, if the, if the church largely taught six-day creation, that is very likely this is what was in Scripture. And the long age views were there, not because of what Scripture teaches, but because of outside influences on Scripture. And the second thing is that uh, people like Hugh Ross has made some uh, very... Um, categorical claims about this. He said, many of the church fathers and other biblical scholars interpreted the creation days of Genesis 1 as long periods of time. And this Josephus, Irenaeus, um, Oregon, Basil, Augustine, and, and Aquinas. And far too many people just take his word for that. We have these... Uh, uh, people at Wheaton College saying that uh, the creation movement began with, with the Seventh-day Adventists uh, in the 19th century. It's a complete load of, of nonsense, uh, as I'll show you. Here is some examples of what people taught. Here is Basil the Great on uh, the creation days, and he was in the 4th century. Uh, one of the great leaders of the early church, a real, real scholar, uh, Trinitarian, ever, all these things. And he gave a series of sermons over Lent, before Easter, um, about the six days of creation. It's called the Hexa Emeron, meaning in six days. And on Genesis 1, he comments, there was evening, there was morning, one day. Now, 24 hours fill up the space of one day. I don't know how you get long creation days from Basil here when he says explicitly that the days of creation were 24 hours. It's so clear here. And he says, it is as though it is said 24 hours measure the space of a day. How much clearer can you get? Now, what uh, some people have been confused about is this view of the church father, the patristic view, they call it. Pater meaning father in Latin. So patristics means the church fathers. And you see, they believed in six literal creation days. But then they applied this passage, one day is like a thousand years, and from this, they produced the idea 
just like some rabbis did, that there was uh, a pattern of 6,000 years for all of Earth's history to, to be uh, fulfilled, and the seventh day was a pattern for a future millennium. Now, I'm not saying they were right about this. I'm just telling you what they actually taught. See, they weren't, didn't believe in 1,000-year creation days, but in literal creation days that were a pattern for 1,000-year periods of Earth history. Okay? So here is one example, Irenaeus. Only in the second century, see, he was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John the, the Evangelist, just two uh, generations removed from the apostles themselves. And he says, For in six days as the world was made, in so many thousand years shall it be concluded. For the day of the Lord is a thousand years. And in six days created things were completed. It's evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the 6,000th year. You see how the pattern is made there. Six literal days of creation um, correspond to 6,000-year periods of earth history. And you see also the implication that he would be called a young earth creationist. At the time of writing, he didn't believe the world was even 6,000 years old. So clearly he, did, he rejected the millions of years that Ross believes in. He did not believe that at all. And you have even uh, the people who wanted to um, uh, later on he says, let the, uh, the philosophers who enumerate thousands of years from the beginning of the world know that the 6,000th year is not yet completed. Isn't it interesting? He didn't believe the world was even 6,000 years at the time of writing. Now, Augustine is one of these guys who wanted to allegorize lots of scripture, although he actually repented of his allegory and, and became a more literal believer in Genesis. But he rejected the old earth. He talked about the Greek philosophers who were teaching the eternal uh, creation that uh, Dr. Faulkner was talking about. He said, they say what they think, not what they know. They are deceived too by those highly mendacious documents which profess to give the history of many thousand years, though reckoning by the sacred writings we find not yet 6,000 years have passed. So quite clearly he believed the world was less than 6,000 years at the time of writing as well. Uh, not millions of years, even though theistic evolutionists want to claim Augustine. He was clearly uh, what we would now call a young earth creationist. Of course, I mean, I think uh, 6,000 years is old, okay? See, age is a relative term. I think anyone over 50 is old. You see, Ross, I mean, believe it or not, he actually said, well, here you go. You've got some passages in the Bible saying the earth is ancient. Therefore, I'm right and the, the young earth people are wrong. But of course, ancient in the biblical term was 6,000 years was ancient. Compared to a human lifespan, that is incredibly ancient. Now, you go, go into the, the Thomas Aquinas, he believed in six literal days as well. I document that in the updated Refuting Compromise. And Martin Luther, he says, we know from Moses the world was not in existence before 6,000 years ago. We assert that Moses spoke in a literal sense, not allegorically or figuratively, that the world with all its creatures was created in six days as the words read. Isn't it interesting? As the words read. And here's his advice uh, to people. If we don't comprehend the reason for this, let's remain pupils and leave the job of teacher to the Holy Spirit. I mean, let, let's, let, let God teach us from his word instead of trying to tell God what he really meant to say. Now, another thing which is a big problem with the old earth position is this whole teaching of uh, where death came from. So you have the very the clear teaching in 1 Corinthians about the gospel, that you know, Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. But this was based on the scriptures teaching where death came from, that it came through a man, and the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ will all be made alive. So you've got a clear teaching that death came through Adam, as we see here. But now, of course, we've got uh, plenty of examples of death. I go come from Australia, where you've got the worst spider in the world, and Sydney funnel web, far worse than the black widow. The black widow is, is not very dangerous, really. It, it hasn't got a very powerful bite. Uh, this thing can bite through a fingernail. And it's also weird because, you know, the black widow, why it's named the black widow? Because the, the, the wife eats the husband after mating. The wife's the most dangerous one. Here, the Sydney funnel web is a male that's the most dangerous. 
And you have things like the deadly box jellyfish and the, the world's deadliest snakes in Australia. Uh, you have even the nasty uh, plants in Australia. So quite a, quite, a, quite a serious place I've left there. The point is, where did all this come from? Well, Martin Luther tells us, if Adam had kept the divine commandment, he never would have died, for death came into the world through sin. The point is, when you have the millions of years, you've got this problem here, this Garden of Eden here, God declaring everything very good, but if millions of years are true, it means you have the fossil record going for millions of years as well, and that means that the Garden of Eden is on a pile of bones miles deep. And the bones, of course, have evidence not only of death, there must be dead things, but also of suffering and disease. You've got uh, bone cancer and gout and osteoporosis, animals tearing each other to pieces uh, in the fossil record. Uh, evolution itself, that biologists believe, says it was death of the unfit that led to man. See, this is totally the opposite of what the biblical picture teaches. Now let's look at death a bit more according to scriptures. Well, clearly um, human death came because of Adam's sin. I believe the, this is referring to human death in Adam. But the point is you're finding uh, uh, undoubted Homo sapiens fossils, and according to dating methods, these guys accept they're at least 160,000 years old and possibly even 200,000 years old. These are undoubted Homo sapiens. So you can't possibly stretch... Adam back that far. No matter how many, I mean, it just doesn't make any sense of the, the genealogy stretching Adam back that far. It's certainly interesting to look at Hugh Ross's website over the years and his books over the years because uh, he, he estimates a date for Adam. And how convenient when they actually bump up the dates for the Australian Aboriginals, the next edition of his book bumps up the date for Adam. But did he get that from Scripture? No, he didn't. There's nothing new in Scripture that would, that would point that out. No, it's because uh, of these so-called sciences. Um, bumping up the date for the um, for Aboriginals, bumping up the date for Adam. But in fact, it won't get you to 160,000 years, though. And that's a big problem. And you got clear, they were clearly humans. They had cultural activity, which is, uh, shows they were proper, fully functioning humans. So, uh, so just human death alone is enough to harm uh, the, um, the Ross-type position of millions of years. Because you're putting human death before Adam. That, that really is, is, can't be defended. Now, animal death, well, the, the teaching of why, why animal death uh, is not allowed before the fall, because you've got vegetarian diets before the fall, quite clearly, tilt in Genesis uh, 1.30. Then you have uh, Isaiah chapters 11 and 65 talking about some future state uh, where there'll be no more, the, the animals are vegetarian again, the, the wolf and the lamb, the lion and the calf, the, the poisonous snake and the child leading them. So once again, you've got these vegetarian animals, and what does God tell us about it? Uh, that they will no longer hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. So quite clearly, hurting and destroying, animals tearing each other to bit, is not the way it's going to be in the future. This is not the way God originally created things. And look at the commentators on, on the book of Isaiah. Whether they believe in Genesis uh, or not, they believe Isaiah was referring to the Garden of Eden when he was writing. Regardless of what they believe about the Eden himself, they believe that Isaiah was referring to, him, to it. It's clearly an Edenic illusion. And Romans 8, the whole creation is groaning and travailing in, in pain because of what happened in Genesis. The commentators on Romans that I've consulted uh, all uh, say that Paul believed it was God's curse on Adam that subjected creation to futility. They may not believe in Genesis, but they clearly believe that Paul accepted Genesis and, and Adam as real people to make their teaching points. Now, plant death... You see, plants are not nefesh hayah. You've got in, the, in Genesis 1, you've got this phrase nefesh hayah, which is translated as living soul. Uh, God uh, formed Adam out of dust, breathed on him, and he became a nefesh hayah, a living soul. But the same phrase is used of the beast and of the fish and of the, of the birds. These are all nefesh hayah, the creatures that are li living creatures. Only living things can die. 
As far as the Bible is concerned, plants are not nefesh chayah. Therefore, plants are not alive in the biblical sense and therefore do not die in the, in the biblical sense. They are described as withering, not as dying. So, I mean, again, a lot of people don't even understand what creationists believe when they talk about, well, our plants must have died of animals' region. Well, no, well, plants don't die as far as the Bible is concerned because they're not alive in the first place. I mean, um, in biology, we'd say that our hair and our skin cells are dead cells, but again, the cells are not nefesh hayah, so it doesn't count again. It's only things which are alive which, will, which can die. So let's get this part of things uh, quite straight. And you've got the very clear teachings that death is called the last enemy to be destroyed. It is not the way God created things. Uh, again, sin into the world through one man and death through sin. So death spread to all men because all sinned. Uh, the wages of sin is death. You see how we've got this clear, consistent teaching that it was sin that brought death into the world. But the long age views undermine this. So you actually got no real answer for the origin of death and suffering uh, because it means that God, uh, that this, this is something that God called very good, which is against what we, uh, common sense must say and against what the Bible teaches. See, again, you look at how many parts the Bible have to be reinterpreted to fit uh, uh, the. Uh, to, to fit. Uh, the the uh, the old earth position is very not very much but left. So let's uh, see where it comes from. Why does this matter so much? Well, look at some of the polls that we have. This is in America. It would be the same in Australia and in Canada, uh, where only uh, you poll the the kids and the youth groups and churches, and only one in three Christian teens intends to continue uh, attending church after they leave home. So many kids in church homes don't stay in the church. I think largely it's because we're with uh, the um, many parts of the church, I mean obviously not the ones you guys go to, I'm talking about a lot of the church, obviously is not providing answers uh, to uh, the so-called science which conflicts with the Bible. Even though it's not true science, uh, but the thing is, if we're not taught that, then of course they're going to go towards the, the, the so-called science and away from the biblical teaching. Because uh, Jesus told Nicodemus, if I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? See, if we don't defend the Bible on earthly things like the creation dates, like the reality of a global flood, why should we expect the, church, the, the world to believe us on heavenly things, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that marriage is a man and a woman? Is he, um, that's the thing. When churches uh, don't trust the Bible on the uh, earthly things, they lose credibility on the heavenly things. It happened back in Australia. But one of the theistic evolutionists from Moore College, a compromising evangelical institution, was asked by a newspaper about uh, uh, the issue of marriage, and he points out, goes back to Genesis, rightly so. Genesis, uh, we've got man and woman created. Uh, the reporter said to him, but Genesis also teaches creation in six days, and you don't believe that. So why should you believe the other stuff? See, you're not winning. Uh, it favors doing this. You're just losing credibility. They see the inconsistency. And here is where it really goes wrong. This organization, BioLogos, I mean, why I'm, I'm hard on them. Here is one paper that was on BioLog, the BioLogos website. And here is one person saying, if Jesus as a finite human being erred from time to time, there's no reason at all to suppose that Moses, Paul, and John wrote scripture without error. Rather, we are wise to assume that the Bible authors expressed themselves as human beings writing from the perspectives of their own finite broken horizons. Now this has actually crossed the boundary into heresy, this sort of thing. But he's being consistent because he quite clearly sees that Jesus and Paul and John accept the Genesis as real history. He doesn't want to believe that. He's an evolutionist. So he says that they got things wrong. But of course, where it goes to is that he attacked the Bible on, on the moral things as well. It doesn't stop. There's, just no, the, the Bible, there's nothing left of the Bible when he's through with it. So that's why I'm, I'm, uh, it's, it's not just a, a side issue. 
And the thing is, the atheists are encouraged by this sort of thing because here is one person rebuking the atheists because he sees the, the, the comments on the website of the biologists and you can't tell the difference between the atheistic evolutionists and the theistic evolutionists. They sound all the same. And there's no practical difference between atheistic evolution and theistic evolution. But what's the difference? He couldn't tell them apart. In fact, no one could tell them apart. That's the whole point. And he says to the biologist people, by your compromise, um, A, you're not winning them over, but you are signaling to them they are winning you over. They will simply wait you out until you continue in your process of jettisoning everything the world hates about you as a Christian. After all, if I get you to toss such a straightforward chapter, the rest should be child's play. So it's an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, they're not winning friends. And in fact, even Richard Dawkins is not impressed by this. I'll be talking about Dawkins on Friday in my talk, The Greatest Hoax on Earth. But here is something, a rabid atheist, what he really thinks of the people like Biologos. I'll just put my microphone towards my computer speakers uh, so you can hopefully uh, hear it properly. Okay, it's supposed to work. I don't know what's wrong with it. It was working before. Oh, that's a problem with technology. It's not infallible. Oh, well, I'll see if I can get it to be on Friday. It was meant to work today. I'll try and get it to be on Friday. Quite a very, uh, very interesting um, quote from him. No, it's definitely not muted. It's just not playing. You see, you'd see him. You would see him talking. Uh, if it was, I don't know why it's not working. There's a problem with these uh, things. I, I don't know why. I'll, see, I'll have a look at it tonight. Okay. But what he's saying is, again, man, Howard Condor says, was there a defining moment where you made a decision that you didn't believe in God? And Dawkins says, yes, I suppose I switched from Christian theism to some sort of deism around the age of 40 and 50, and then switched to atheism around the age of 60, and it was really evolution that did it. And he says that the, the, the Christians who want to say evolution and the Bible are compatible are deluded. He uses the word deluded to describe uh, the people who want to um, match evolution in the Bible. So these guys are not impressed uh, with uh, these compromises at all. And just to, to remind you a bit more about what uh, I've been talking about there, um, Jesus, the, the, these biologist people are guilty of this canotic heresy I, I talked about this morning where they believe that uh, when Jesus um, took on human nature, somehow he lost his divinity. Well, no, he didn't. He, he added humanity. He didn't subtract divinity. And the thing is, when he did that, let's, let's uh, contrast a few things here. That Jesus voluntarily limited his omniscience, so he didn't know the day or the hour. But the thing is, what he did talk about he preached without error. And he also preached with the authority, his own absolute authority, as well as with the authority of God the Father. So if you attack uh, Jesus as without error, you have to attack God the Father as having, uh, having error as well. And this uh, article here, creation.com slash authority, would be worth having a look at. See, I've got these shortcuts here for articles so you can remember them and look them up. It doesn't take too long to write them. And let's uh, look at something else here. Um, I want to contrast these things as well, which are misunderstand. Now, there's a concept of adaptation to finitude. Like a mother will tell her young child, you grew in my tummy, okay? That's not wrong, okay? It's not scientifically precise, uh, like using the words like uterus and all that, but it's still accurate because the tummy is the general region around here, okay? There's nothing wrong with, with telling a four-year-old uh, this sort of thing. It's not inaccurate. It's just simplified to the child's level. But what about the teaching that uh, a stork brought you? That is just a clear error. You can't say that's an approximation. That is an error, not an, a, a, a simplified language. Now, let's, um, as the Bible uses some of the simplified language in places, I mean, the Bible doesn't talk about quantum mechanics, but it still talks accurately about everything it talks about. There are no mistakes, just simplified language so people of all age of the last uh, few thousand years could understand it, 
It had to be in this sort of language. And theologians today are still learning from the Bible. The Bible doesn't exhaust us, even though we've got far more science. The Bible still has so much to teach us in its depth. But it still uses language that can be understood through all ages. All ages of human history as well as all ages of, 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 of people. The thing is, I would say if evolution were true, that Genesis is more like the stork than simplified language. And the reason, as I mentioned before, the order of events is, is, is wrong and the time scale is wrong. In fact, you can't get anything more diametrically opposed to evolution than what Genesis teaches. It, it, it opposes evolution in every single way. Uh, the the who, 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 um, who created it, God, the created, Genesis, God created it. Evolution said things made itself. Evolution says it took over millions of years and it, and it had a certain order of events that was contradictory to what Genesis teaches. So it's more like the stork brought you than you grow in my tummy. And the thing is, Jesus was not one to accommodate mistakes because the thing is, he was crucified precisely because he challenged the errors of his day. They wouldn't have bothered to crucify him otherwise if he hadn't uh, challenged things. But the thing is, when it came to the authority of Scripture, he affirmed it and went further than what they were doing because he actually attacked them for holding to the, to the, tr the traditions of man where it contradicted the Word of God. So you know, he affirmed and reinforced their belief that the Bible was authoritative. There was no accommodation whatsoever. Now, I want to leave the last thing with... Um, Augustine, who is often quoted, he said, It foreseems to me that the most disastrous consequences must follow upon our believing that anything false is found in the sacred books. That is to say, that the men by whom Scripture has been given to us and committed to writing did put down in these books anything false, he says. For once you admit to such a high sanctuary of authority, one false statement as made in the way of duty, there will be not left a single sentence of those books which, if appearing to anyone difficult in practice or hard to believe, may not, by the same fatal rule, be explained um, away as a statement in which, intentionally and under a sense of duty, the author declared what was not true. Once you start to admit the Bible has mistakes in it, where do you stop? There's nothing left. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That's out the window as well. So is love your neighbor as yourself. There's just nothing left in the Bible. And it's no wonder uh, the, the churches who, uh, Francis Collins himself, he believes in the abomination of embryonic stem cell research, which is a fraud. It hasn't produced any cures, unlike adult stem cell research, which has produced over 70 different cures. It's hard to keep up with them all. But you see, Collins, his, his uh, disbelief in Genesis has also turned to disbelief in biblical morality, that life begins at conception. They've, and also man was not given dominion over other men. Yet embryonic stem cell research is, is having us dominion over miniature humans that have been conceived and harvesting them for body parts, basically. So uh, this is uh, the, what I really want to, uh, to leave you, you all with. And just to, to, to close off, uh, remind you of what we, we're supposed to be doing. One is the negative thing. We are demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. So that, then we have the positive. Be ready always to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that is in you. Uh, 1 Peter 3.15. So you've got the two prongs. One is, is defending the Christian faith. The other is demolishing arguments against the Christian faith. Those are the two prongs of apologetics, defending the faith in the Bible. And there are a few things that might help you with this. And here is, is one of them. Here is uh, what Ken Ham, you may have heard of Ken Ham. This is what he said about refuting compromise. I'm not trying to blow my own trumpet of saying this is what Ken Ham said about it, uh, that it was a classic and that important. And he goes on to say... Uh, that I believe every single person needs a copy of this book to show the positive aspects that we can defend logically the book of Genesis and that God's word is authoritative right from the very beginning and we can confront compromise uh, like progressive creationism. This is so Ken Ham was saying everyone should get a copy of Refuting Compromise. That's what he, he has uh, said uh, in, the, in the past. And he's never retracted this either. And here is something from Canada. Here is uh, something which surprised me. It was actually from Canada. Uh, describing a meeting with an evangelist. 
a Christian speaker, uh, but then a, a tattooed young man came to the mic and asked the Christian speaker, do you believe in an old earth or a young earth? And the speaker said there are intelligent people on both sides and he wasn't going to get bogged down on that topic. The important thing was to worry about the resurrection of, of, Genesis, of Jesus and not worry about Genesis, he said. But this didn't satisfy the guy. And, and the, the person who was telling us this uh, said he approached the young man and was not happy with the speaker's answer. He said he came to believe in God and in Jesus as a result of reading this one. And the thing is, I wrote this book for, for the Christians, not for the non-Christians. It wasn't written as an evangelistic book. But the thing is, I mean, it's interesting about how God works. The Holy Spirit uh, works uh, in mysterious ways. The wind blows where you don't even know about it. You see, I wasn't writing this book for the Christian, uh, for the non-Christians, but here is someone who uh, came, to, uh, came to faith because of this book, he said. And he tells us uh, that he'd been an atheist for 15 years and was halfway through the book and as a result came to believe. That wasn't my intention. I'm happy with the result. So you see well, what our, our material is, uh, can do. This shows that, that what we're doing is not, a, is not a side issue. It really does have an effect on people. It really does help bring people to know uh, the living Savior, who is also our creator. And a few other books you might be interested in. Of course, the Answers book, of, of chapter 2 is about the days of creation. Chapter 3 is about the gap theory. And all sorts of other things uh, as well, 20 different chapters and 60 questions. A book I'd like to recommend uh, by uh, Andrew Kulikowski, who's an Australian as well. A very, a very good book about uh, the, these sorts of issues, uh, uh, quite in depth about the history of interpretation, the meaning of Genesis, as well as application of the Dominion Mandate. Uh, to understand uh, some of the environmental hy hype that goes on there, a proper understanding of, of this. Um, Creation Without Compromise by a Man in Atlanta, Donald Crow, and he talks about how, how evolution has had such harmful effects in things like the, the Nazi regime, as well as in, in the teaching of eugenics back in the States. It, right uh, up to the world, Second World War, about 60,000 Americans were sterilized against their will because of, of a very uh, a strong eugenics um, push supported by leading politicians and, and, and judges. Uh, thanks to evolution. So he, he talks about those sorts of things here. And of course, we've got things like um, evolution and the Holocaust documenting the Nazi connection uh, to evolution, showing a Nazi propaganda film that clearly taught about how we have sinned against the law of natural selection and these, we've allowed these unfit people to, to live even though they are lower than the beasts. Quite a clear teaching there. And of course, we've got these big packs there. Oops, forget that. It's American prices, sorry. Uh, but we've got these huge packs, which I recommend to anyone. And of course, our website of about over 8,000 articles now. So, does anyone have any questions uh, for me about what I've been talking about? I'll try and repeat the question for the benefit of the, of the tape as well. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay, now, I, I remember I said I didn't necessarily say that these guys were right. I'm just saying this is what these guys believed. Uh, because a common misconception is these guys taught 6,000 year creation days. This is not what they taught. I'm just telling you what they taught. I'm not endorsing this. Okay? There's a difference between saying what they believed as well rather than what I believe. Okay? Um, CMI is uh, we might say we specialize in protology, not eschatology. Eschatology is, is end times. Protology is the beginning times. That's our business. Eschatology is not something we take a stand on. We can't. We lose our, our focus if we try to take stands on, uh, on the end times. We would, we'd uh, lose our, um, our focus into the different churches if we took a stand. We just can't do that. There's certainly we do take a stand on, that's in our statement of faith, and that includes the Trinity and the resurrection. These are vital Christian doctrines, and we have a stand that Jesus is coming, to, coming back, but we don't know when. Uh, that's not our thing. Okay, who's got a question? I'll try and see you, of course. Um, yeah, yes, sir, I see you. Yep.
Okay, here are the questions about debates. Now, for one thing, I want to make it uh, clear. Some churches seem to be very enthusiastic about getting us to debate some evolutionists or compromise. Now, what I would tell them, though, is that the church people, they have the evolutionary side, the millions of years side, six days a week already in the education system. The media system has a monopoly on evolution. We are the other side. So they say they want to hear both sides. Well, we have the one chance they get to, to hear the, the biblical side because they're hearing the evolutionary side all the rest of the time. Why should they give up half our side, our time to them as well when they've got the rest of the week to do that? I mean, and in Canada last year, uh, some professor was atheist was trying to take over my talk on the question time. I told him, well, you wouldn't let me have your um, part of your, your, your lecturing time in the semester. You're not going to have any of my time in my talk here. I put him in his place. Okay, um, so I, th I think they're overrated and also debating, I mean, that's why, I mean, it, 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 it might have its point as, as gladiatorial combat, but whether it actually is, is a good way of deciding truth is another matter. Now, as far as debate's concerned, now, we have actually challenged people like Richard Dawkins to a debate. He wouldn't debate me, okay? So it has been, we've, we've offered Richard Dawkins, he wouldn't, he refused. Also, Hugh Ross uh, was challenged to debate me in 07. The American Vision people wanted him to debate me. He refused to debate me. He demanded an apology for my book, Refuting Compromise. It had hurt him, he says, told people. <laughs> so I had to apologize. But then on the stand, when another debater was substituted, he told the audience um, with a straight face, well, congratulations. Most other young earth creations are afraid of me. Yet he, he had turned me down in the debate, and yet he told the audience that creations were afraid to debate him. So this is Hugh Ross, okay? So, so the thing is, uh, here, here is a chance. I, I've, uh, I've um, had a chance to uh, offer to debate Dawkins and, and Hugh Ross, and they've turned us down. So I'm not going to keep chasing. Otherwise, it sounds a bit like a, like a girl who's a guy who keeps on chasing after a girl who's not interested in him. I, I'm not going to keep on chasing Ross. Um, if he uh, wants to play chicken, that's his problem. But, but to do pull him into account if he says that young earthers are afraid to debate him because uh, he has turned me down, yeah. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, okay, it's about the public education system. Now, I mean, the thing is, CMI is not a lobby group. We, we, we think that, we're, well, my own opinion is that there should be alternatives to the public education system because otherwise what happens is that the uh, certain people capture it and it's a monopoly. That's the thing with the government in general. We are not a lobby group to try to change that, but we would like to provide alternatives like homeschooling, Christian schooling. Of course, I believe that creation should be allowed to present a case. They should have alternatives, but the thing is, uh, I'm not so sure that it's productive to, to be a lobby group to make things compulsory because, um, for one thing, I wouldn't want to have an atheistic teacher teaching about creation because he'll just distort it. He'll set up straw men. That's what they do. It's what Dawkins does. So your thing is, uh, you can even if you made it compulsory to teach creation, you wouldn't, uh, you can't make it compulsory to teach it properly. Well, you can make it compulsory, but it's not going to be a bait. That's all. Uh, you can't, it's just something you can't force. Yeah. Yes, Ma, right? Hmm. It's a very difficult question because it's very hard because uh, you have, the school has them for, uh, what, six hours a day, five days a week. I don't know where you're going to fit the time in. I mean, that's my opinion. I'm not going to tell you how to, what to do. I mean, I'm a fan of homeschool, but I'm not saying as a, as a CMI person that you must homeschool. It's not, not my job. I mean, you've got to make your own decision how you want to teach your, your kids, okay? I'm not going to be hard on you either way. It is a hard thing. I don't know what, uh, what to do about the public school. I think it's a case that parents do have to uh, know what's being taught and have to spend the, children, the time with their kids. I mean, uh, the school can't be the parents. You are the parents. You, you've got to spend the time with your kids, okay? Oh, sounds Okay, sure, Bob. okay. Yeah, so uh, when to do it, I think right at the beginning. In fact, even before they're learning evolution at school, I think you should be teaching them the truth of creation. And um, they should learn about evolution. They should learn more than the evolutionists want to teach them. They should learn evolution, warts and all. Uh, I don't believe in the sort of sheltering. They, they don't even teach about evolution. Don't mention, no, I don't believe that. You should teach them. They, they need to be prepared for what they're going to get.
in the schools and the universities. So you've got to teach them what they're likely to have and what is wrong with it. And also uh, see if you can teach them what, uh, what is the assumption the teachers are working from. Not just the facts, but look, these teachers are interpreting the facts under a certain worldview. So the kids learn how to pick up the worldview uh, of the teachers. That is actually a materialistic worldview. They're interpreting the facts. So, so get your, your kids a good worldview detector. That's what you need to teach them as well. Okay, no matter where they're being taught. Okay, one more question before it's time to go. Uh, yes, sir, I see you there. Yes. Uh, what's the question about planetarium? Oh, I assume it goes all right. I, I don't really know much about it, sorry. Uh, I, I mean, I'm not really, we're not connected with them anymore, so I really don't... don't really know. I presume Jason and I will be part of it and it probably wouldn't be too bad, but I, I just don't know enough about it. Maybe, maybe a question on the theology and I'll see what I can do. The lights in me, so I can't see. Uh, yes, I see one. Uh, okay, here you go. You want to? Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, we continue our coverage of Creation 2011, the last session with Dr. Jonathan uh, Sarfati, Refuting Compromise, very, very interesting. By the way, I had a personal chat with uh, Hugh Ross myself uh, several years ago. Fascinating how that the, uh, the division is there. We'll talk more about that as we go along. Uh, tomorrow, uh, although we'll sign off tonight, tomorrow we have Dr. Jim Mason, nuclear physicist. He's going to be talking about the physics of a young earth. That's going to be fascinating. Hey, that's beginning close to 9 o'clock, about 8.30ish, and so make sure you tune into the website then. Dr. John Samford, how evolution hurts science. Yes, it's true. We're going to be doing that tomorrow at about 10 o'clock. And then we're going to take a break in the afternoon tomorrow night. Dr. Robert Carter, coral reefs and the flood. So we're going to get into ocean marine biology, coral reefs with Dr. Carter. It's going to be very, very good. And then we have another session, and probably one of my favorite uh, speakers is Gary Bates. Alien Intrusion, Part 1. Now, question is, where do aliens fit in to the biblical worldview? Did God create aliens from a planet, what was that, far, far away? Or is something else going on? Well, we'll talk about that. Gary Bates is going to be with us, so it's going to be a good time tomorrow. I do hope you will join us. I am standing, by the way in front of the mobile, commonly called the hurricane. And so uh, this is where our equipment is, our control room is, as we cover the conference here at Muskoka Bible Center. And so we want you to be a part of the action. Join in. We're, we're still continuing to try to find the, the chat room. It's not working out too well. We're having a lot of difficulty from the spot in which we are at uh, to get the chat room going. But we're going to get an email going or something uh, by this time tomorrow and so that you can submit your questions because as the week continues on, uh, on Tuesday, we'll be doing a lot more question and answer from the Internet. All right, for now, it's live from Muskoka Bible Center, the Super Creation Conference 2011. I'm Rod Hembry with Bible Discovery TV Network, and we will see you tomorrow right here at the same site and right here with the same Creation Science 2011. All right, we'll see you next time. Stay there. Join us tomorrow.